afterwards, there, there will always be people who, who will say, oh, West Ham went out, they scored four goals at home, therefore David Moyes is vindicated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Where I think the reality of it is you put in Kudus and Pakatar and it makes a massive difference to your ability to project forward, to bring the team forward, to be positive, to get yeah. the ball into the opposition final third quicker. Hello everybody and welcome to Ramble Reacts. Jared Bowen bags his first ever hat-trick for the Hammers. I'm Marcus Speller. And I'm Andy Brassel. Welcome one and all to Ramble Reacts. Andy, it's a bloody pleasure to have you with me and the listeners <laughs> here. And that's how I see it. The listeners and I are here. It's just who's going to join us. That's the question. That is, that is the question. Uh, th- we've already had someone or something join Jared Bowen because in the post-match interview where he's linking up to the Sky Studio, it's like on a plinth next to him, you've got the hat-trick ball oh. of Jared Bowen. So I guess depending on the angle, it looks like either it's like on a really nondescript bit of furniture or it's sort of levitating in the air. It's It's like the sort of... You know, in the last Star Wars films, which obviously people have very split opinions on, the way that um, uh, Kylo Ren has Darth Vader's mangled mask on top of a plinth. Yeah. It's, it's very man cave-ish. It feels like you know exactly where that's going in Jared Bowen's house when he gets it home. Yeah, and of course, it's not accurate to say anymore, oh, he gets to take home the match ball. It's he gets to take home one of the match balls. Yes. Because of the multi-ball system, Andy, that we all know and love nowadays, you don't actually get to take the match ball home because that would be quite something if play um, was contained for so long and they just kept the same ball. The ball boys and girls wouldn't be doing the job, quite frankly. So, no, that's, uh, that's, that's true. That's true. I mean, the multi-ball system has been abused over the years. You remember at Sevilla years and years ago where they used to, when they were winning 1-0 with a couple of minutes left, they used to get all the ball boys and girls <laughs> to throw them on the pitch simultaneously to disrupt the flow. I'll tell you what, Paolo Dybala scored a hat-trick for Roma earlier and he did something quite clever because they have this thing in Spain and Italy now. They have this thing where they each ball that goal is scored with, they take it away, put it in a sack and they sell it for charity afterwards. And you think, okay, oh, fair right. enough. But um, what he did is when he scored his hat-trick goal against Torino today. Dybala took the ball out of the net, went behind the goal to the curva to celebrate and just threw it to a guy in the crowd. And so he got Dybala's hat-trick ball. Oh, right. He was like, don't worry, mate. I'd rather this go to you than anybody get any charitable <laughs> money from it. <laughs> what a little scumbag. What a dirty little... Um, it's Argentina for I'm you. I'm sure that's not what his motivation... <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure I've done him a great disservice. I have, I have no doubt. Um, he scored a hat trick. Jared Bowen scored a hat trick as well. Andy, uh, a, a lovely hat trick it was. His first ever senior hat trick, which is quite something. Yeah, it was a blistering start to the game. Andy Brassel. I mean, barely had we sat down, and suddenly West Ham were playing the West Ham way. I don't know if it's too simple <laughs> to say it's all down to Lucas Pakatar because they they spent a, a long time. It felt like on Sky talking beforehand about is he someone you want to build a team round or is he is he too unreliable? And Guy Oclichi was like quite cold on him. I th- I thought which was which was quite mm. interesting because he said, "Oh, I saw him in in France and." I mean, I saw him in France and I've got a slightly different view on it, but I, I think it was interesting. Because... That's the kind of thing you say, Andy. You know, I saw <laughs> yeah. him playing for Leon. He wasn't very good. Therefore, he's never going to be any good anywhere else at any point of his career. <laughs> no, no, that's what you hear. That's not what I say. <laughs> it's a slight difference. All right. but I, I think... Why don't you rate Kenny Tete? I do, I do rate... He's, he's, he's fine for Fulham. He's fine for Fulham, Marcus. Okay, and I tell you what, he'd probably be the best player in the Leon team now. <laughs> but but I, I think I think the thing with 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 Pakhtar, I don't know if it's a bit simplistic to say this, but afterwards there, there will always be people who who will say, "Oh, West Ham went out; they scored four goals at home. Therefore, David Moyes is vindicated, etc., etc., etc." Where I think the reality of it is, you put in Kudus and Pakatar, and it makes a massive difference to your ability to project forward, to bring the team forward, to be positive, to get yeah. the ball into the opposition final third 
quicker. And it made a, a massive difference. And, and Pakatar, despite what Gao Clichy was saying, I, I, I thought, it, he's, he's perfect for the Premier League, actually. Because not only... Mm -hmm. Has he got incredible technique? He's very. He wants to play football at pace, and he's prepared to get stuck in, as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, it's, it's a couple of bits that you you sort of touched on there, Andy, with regards to the the kind of the the story of the match. West Ham obviously went two 0 up very very early on. Then then Neil Morpay pulled one back. At one point, it was four one to West Ham, and it looked pretty comfortable. Did it feel 4 one to you at that point? Yeah. No, it didn't really. And even at 4-1, then Vissa scores late on. Now, I know you get an awful lot of injury time now, and I think footballers may forget that, and you can't blame them, because if it's if you look at the clock and it's 88-89 and, you, and you're two goals down, you might think, ah, oh, you know, it's, it's not really happening for us. And then suddenly it's like mm. plus seven. It's almost like the clock gets wound back to 83 minutes. You kind of, oh, hang on, we, we've got a chance here. But I, yeah, as you said, West Ham scored four goals and in the end were, I say, reasonably comfortable. They, they had a two-goal cushion and, and finished the match with that two-goal mm. cushion. Yeah, it's not the most entirely convincing win, though, is it? No. No, and I, I think that's absolutely right, Marcus. It's, it's the difference between um, absorbing what actually happened in the match and just going off the result, really, isn't it? Because I, I guess as time goes past, people forget the detail and you'll probably say, oh, it's just a consolation goal, really, for, for Vissa. But it, it really could have been something. I, I, you know, you talk about... Um, Jared Bowen winning the game for West Ham and I, I think that's a, a not not an unreasonable perspective of course um, he, he was vital he got them off to a great start when he's on it he's just brilliant to watch he's one of the best players in the in, in the Premier League to watch I think it's, it's a point that Jim yeah. makes actually again and again and he, he is such fun uh -huh. but um, I don't think it's a stretch at the same time to say Alphonse Ariola made sure they won the game I mean, there are a couple of great saves yeah, in there, he, particularly one from yeah. Ivan Tony at, 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 at the end. And mm. West Ham will always, well, I would say they'll always give you a chance. They will always give you more than one chance. Let's let's be honest. Uh -huh. Do you do you feel then with West Ham that, you know, Moyes has had his critics and he will always have his critics, quite frankly, at mm. West Ham as long as he manages them. You know, um, they're in the top half of the table. They've got, a, you know, that they're contenders to finish in the top half of the table. Mm. I don't know whether fans of, of West Ham or clubs around there would think that's a huge achievement or not. They're still in European competition. You know, come the summer, as I say, they could finish re respectably in the league. They might mm. have had another good run in Europe. Who, who, who knows how that'll kind of work? Well, they've already had, they've already done well. They could go a bit, a bit further. It's unlikely Moyes will be there come the summer. Do I think? personally think. Yeah, think? I I think that I, I I suspect he'll probably move on, but 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 either or, I'm sort of straying from my, the point I want to kind of make. Do okay. you feel it is the individual quality that is 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 propelling West Ham? I, mean, I say propelling them; it's their first win of 2024, um, so you know they've not done particularly well of late. But do you think that they are just relying on that individual quality rather than a proper plan and strategy? and what not from the manager. Well, I think there is a plan. I just don't think it's a particularly exciting one unless you've got those guys in, right. in the team. And when you spend a reasonable amount on players and when you have a stadium that's that big, I, th I think there's kind of an obligation to entertain. And that's before we get into mm -hmm. the weeds of, of West Ham's history and what sort of football they like to play. And as you say, the West Ham way and all, all, all that sort of stuff. I think I, I don't really want to fall into the trap of saying when a team's doing well, aren't the players brilliant? And when a team's doing badly, isn't the manager crap? I, I think that's an incredibly reductive way of looking at things. But Moyes is like, there's no middle ground with Moyes, is there? He's Brexit because you either think um, <laughs> he's... Well, he, he, he is because you always think... You could say he's Marmite. No, he is, he is the issue of Brexit. I'm not saying he represents the decision to leave the European <laughs> Union. There's a slight difference. He's the Brexit debate. So I, I, I think people either think he's done a brilliant job for West Ham because he's got them in Europe three times in a row. Um, he took them away from relegation and um, 
that th 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 they won a European trophy under him. And so there's no argument on a results level. I mean, I think there's nuance and that there probably is argument on a results level because I think at times they should have, okay. certainly in the league last season, they should have done much better with the, with the resources they had than they actually did and winning the trophy saved them. Winning the, 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 the European um, mm -hmm. trophy saved them. Conference but, league. Are you, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, uh, and and there, there are people on the other side who will say... Uh, the football's trash. It's in the front of West Ham. And once he loses one or two key players, they're absolutely in the mud. And I, I think realistically, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. I think you, you can spend enough time talking, and we can spend enough time talking about David Moyes at West Ham, not to say either he's amazing and he, he deserves to be canonised and he's better than John Lyle, and mm. saying oh, he's, his football's really boring and he's shit and fans shouldn't have to put up with it. I, I, I think there is an opinion somewhere in the middle. I think you can say there are some things that he's done that have been extraordinary while he's been coach and there are other bits where his limitations have, have been exposed. I, I, think, I think it's fine to say that. Well, look, I, I thought that he might not be there kind of come the summer. Um, but, I mean, he has been offered a new contract so it seems by West Ham he'll decide his, yeah he'll decide his future at the end of the season and I think it it may well be Moyes who decides yeah it may be time it's it, yeah. it's time to move on was was perhaps I mean, it was rumoured that his um, relationship with technical director Tim uh, Stighton is, is, a, is a potential sticking point um, so we, we shall see what comes out in the wash there but let's let's go back to the actual game itself because I don't want to lose sight of the fact that Jarrah Bowen scored a hat-trick. Uh, on yesterday's Football Ramble, we were talking about, very briefly talked about Ollie Watkins and what he's been doing, and it would be very hard on him if he doesn't get in the England squad, but the feeling is Ivan Tony will be the backup to Kane. Mm. Well, what about Jared Bowen? Because he is playing through the centre for West Ham. However, we know he can play on one of the flanks, uh, you know, on the on the the right side in particular of a, of a front three. Mm. Uh, he's, he's played a little bit there for England as well. Not too much, but he's, he's had a few caps. Would that be a potential option for Southgate, Andy? Because he can play on one of the flanks. I know there's fierce competition in those those places, but he also doubles up as somebody who can, who can go through the centre. I personally think he's probably on the periphery of the squad, but what do you think yourself? I'm into the idea. I'm really into the idea. I, I, I think Ooh. what you underlined there, the versatility. <clears throat> I mean, I, I suppose it's, it's a bit of a cliche of, of, of picking tournament squads, but to have someone who's not in the first 11 that can cover a number of different positions, a number of different forward positions is, is really important. I think when you talked about Ivan Tony maybe having the drop on Ollie Watkins, I mean, I, I would think that's... I, I don't. I don't think that's fair. I, th I think Watkins should go ahead of uh, Tony. To be to be perfectly honest, that, that, that's that's just my opinion. But I, I, yeah, think, I, I don't think it's unreasonable at all to think that. I, I, I think that when you when you look at the case for including Tony, so much of it is personality based. You feel he's he's a leader. He's got a bit about him. He can and Jared take Bowen. a penalty, Andy, for crying <laughs> and out loud. Well. He can take a penalty. <laughs> <laughs> but but Jared, Jared Bowen is a huge personality in a, in a very different way, I think. And he's a leader in a, in a very different way. So it, it manifests slightly differently. But I think Jared Bowen, not just because he's, he's worked himself up from, from the lower divisions, you know, thinking Hereford, Rochdale, um, Hull, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I think the fact that even at the so age Tony, of, by the way. Yes, of course. But even and, and that's uh -huh. that's part of the persona, isn't it? But even at the age mm -hmm. that that he is, I mean, Tony has continued to develop and has become a better version of himself. Whereas, I think Bowen has developed and is continuing to develop because you're talking about him adapting to being a centre forward this season. For him to be able to do that at this advanced stage in his career. I think that's enormously impressive and that you could put him in loads of different spots and get him to do loads of different mm -hmm. jobs. I mean, if you're talking about Tony, you're talking about sending him to backup Kane and, and that's it. And how would he deal with 
not playing. That, that's, that's the great unknowable, really, isn't it? Whereas you think, not only is, if you're talking about a choice between the two, not only is, is, is Bowen more adaptable, I think, and more versatile, but because, he's, because he is more versatile, he's got more opportunities to get minutes. So you, you're, you're less concerned about, you know, because I think that's, that's the, the major part, isn't it, of picking squad players for your squad. The guys who aren't in the 11, they have to be able to handle not being the main guy and not playing. So you look at those moments, for example, when Tony stands up and obviously it was focused on on Sky, the fact that, you know, after the second goal, he's the guy who leads the powwow in the middle of the pitch and goes, come on, lads, let's just take a breath. What are we doing here? Mm. And you know that that leadership is is sort of invaluable. Is that really needed with England, though? Do you think? Mm. Well, Andy, you spoke about personality types and and how they're crucial um, when it comes to well, it comes to anything, but particularly tournament football when you you're away potentially for a long time, cooped up with everybody. Do you mm. think, on the basis of his personality? And it would be a rogue move, I understand. He hasn't been capped by them yet. But do you think France should go for Neil Morpé? <laughs> you are just looking for ways to undermine France. And I, I admire it, Spells. I admire it. Just, <laughs> Get just him take in a, there. Take a deep breath. I'm going to send you a few yep. clips on WhatsApp after we've finished here of Dio Pumacano <laughs> and the sort of season he's been having. And i tell you what, after that, right. you are going to sleep like a baby tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear he, I, I, I fear that Neil Morpé is becoming a bit of a caricature of himself but but still <laughs> yeah but yeah I mean he was he, he seemed to be winding up Kevin Nolan although Kevin Nolan Morpé had walked off and Kevin Nolan seemed to be having a go at somebody else at one point and I thought to myself yeah Kevin Nolan Neil Morpé that they'll find a way to yes. uh, to have a bit of aggro they are ragging kindred no spirits that, they are, Andy. Yeah. Neil Morpé is uh, he, among the goals again tonight. Um, he, is, he is popping up with the odd one or two here for, for Brentford, mm. we have to say. So so, so, so kudos there. Um, but we have to mention Emerson's goal, Andy Brassel. What a sweet oh. strike. Oh, it's absolutely magnificent. It's was, it was, it was, it was brilliant. And uh, I think the fact that it felt quite undeserved as well. <laughs> but the, but the fans called for it when he had the chance to yeah. shoot. You, you heard everyone going, shoot, shoot. And he was like, all right, I will then. <laughs> right, so they're, they're going to be, every time he gets the ball now, anywhere near the vicinity of the goal, that's what they're going to be chanting or, or shouting. It was utterly glorious. Beautiful technique on it as well. Yeah, it was. Um, what, do you, what do you think of Emerson? He, um, I mean, he, Lewis Potter seemed to give him a bit of bother down Ooh. that side. Um, but, uh, but how do you rate Emerson? I, I like him. I, I sometimes feel that his attacking qualities as underlined um, sort of obscure the fact that in another way, he's he's not really suited to being a, a fullback. He's more of a third mm. centre-back kind of fullback, really, isn't, isn't, isn't he? You know, great left foot. That's what you mean. Unbelievable technique, but he's not, he's not exactly live, is he? You know, I, I think you no. generally expect fullbacks to be a little bit more mobile than that. He, he is athletic, but he's he's not he's not super quick, mm. and I think if you go back over the last couple of weeks, and you know now Kieran Trippier's got somewhere nearer to acceptable form for Newcastle. <laughs> he's he's passed on the jinx to Dan Byrne, who's having yeah. the month and a half from hell at the moment, is, is isn't he? Yeah. And you know he, he looks he looks like he's carrying a bag of rocks up a hill at the moment, doesn't he? It's it's it's, it's, it's really unfortunate, <laughs> but. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll get there in the end. It's, it's not like Burns a bad player or anything like that, but he looks really exposed in that fullback position. And Emerson always has the potential for that to, for that to happen to him. But what you said about Lewis Potter, it's funny. You keep mentioning Brentford players, and you know, Lewis Potter, great to watch. I love uh, Tony and Morpai as, a, as, as, a, as a pair. Um, I, I was thinking towards the end of that, Damsgaard. I can't believe he's still not got a goal or assist 
in the Premier League. I mean, he's only started about 10 Premier League games since he's, he's joined, hasn't he? Which, when you consider yeah. he was joining off the back of that, that brilliant goal against England in the, the, the Euro semi-final uh, at Wembley, and, you know, he's, he's someone who's really yeah, highly course, rated in the, 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 the Danish football community. I think it's unbelievable that he hasn't, hasn't been able to produce more since he's at Brentford. But so many times, I've, I've seen Brentford in the flesh of, a few times this season, and I always come away with the feeling of, oh yeah, they're really good, aren't they? And then you look at the results. And, and, and they've I, lost I, again. I, I keep saying, yeah, I keep saying, well, you, you can't, can't judge it all by the results. You know, that's not a description of what happened in the game. But the reality is, especially with Everton getting some points back, like they are in yeah. the shit. Like, like Brentford are genuinely in the well, shit. The- and you look at the fixtures they've got coming up as well. And they've what, lost 10 of the last 12 in the Premier League? It's awful. Yeah, they, they are struggling. Uh, they are struggling. And of course, you mentioning Everton there. That was huge news earlier today because, of course, we're recording this just after the uh, the, mm. the, the match on Monday night that, that Everton have uh, had their, their 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 punishment reduced from 10 points to 6 points. I'm sure everybody has seen this. Uh, now, they can still be punished more points. We've got to wait for the, for the other investigation going. It's all getting a bit messy, isn't it? And obviously, yeah. Nottingham Forest are... Uh, subject to that as well and we'll discuss um, this further on Wednesday's ramble where Andy and myself will be joined by Jim and Pete but yes so Everton's um, Everton getting four points back if you like for now that's what we've got to go with they're now into 15th Brentford are into 16th and we spoke on um, Monday's ramble that Forest are in trouble and yeah. I just sort of thought about Brentford and I said, oh, but Brentford, they've got Tony back. I think they'll be okay. Which is ultimately, if you push me, what I do think. But Luton now have got a game in hand on, on Forrest and Brentford. Mm-hmm. They are four points behind Forrest, five points behind Brentford. It is achievable now for Luton. Mm. I mean, it's been, I, I know they would argue it's been achievable for, for, for a while, but suddenly you look at that, they are the teams that are trying to reel in. Now, I know Bournemouth are only three points above Brentford, but Bournemouth season seems to be a lot better um, than what Brentford have been doing. So when you look at the teams down there, Andy, you've, you've talked about Brentford. Do you, do you think Brentford are really in this, or do you expect Tony to get among the goals and to them to get out of it? Well, he, he has he has been amongst the goals. He's, he's he's played pretty well, I would say, and and they're still in it. You know, there's there's a, a lot of problems with them, and I think producing a consistent ninety minutes is, is is probably the premier of those problems. To to be honest, because you wouldn't see the, Thomas Frank losing his job, would you? I mean, one of the safer managers in the Premier. It's League. hard to imagine, but if they got relegated, I could imagine him falling on his sword definitely, because it would be such yeah, a yeah. a massive disappointment. I, I think. I mean, uh-huh. the, the future for Brentford is. A bit difficult to read anyway, because it looks like Matthew Benham's trying to sell the club. And his way of running things has given them such a leg up, really. They've got no other natural advantages. You know, they've not got... They've got an, a, a new stadium, but it's um, it's bijou, I think you can say in Premier League terms. It's, it's, it's not a license to print money or anything like that. Um, they've not got yeah, a, a yeah. enormous natural wealth. I think, you know, they've they've been managed very sensibly and very prudently and um you know you don't want them just selling to some random i think it's fair to say but going on sure. the, the overall relegation picture as you, you were looking at I, I, th- I think brentford are properly in it obviously forest are, are, are properly in it i think they've got a fixture list that could go either way there's enough winnable fixtures in there but you know you just don't know what you're going to get from them on, on on any given day that they're they're incredibly inconsistent and Bournemouth I mean they are another team a little bit like Brentford where you see what the plan is you like the aesthetics they were excellent against Manchester City at the, the, the weekend you know we're not going to judge them on mm-hmm. like losing by one goal to Manchester City for goodness sakes but that they they are another team that need points and quickly but if you think of there being a pressure a pressure on one team in particular to screw some points and quickly it's Forest because of what might be coming and you think they've got Liverpool on mm. on the on the on the weekend it's it's not ideal is it really certainly not ideal Andy all right well we will um as I say talk about Everton on Wednesday and uh, we shall see the relegation picture unfolding in, in the coming matches um and it's some very, very sad and, and disappointing news uh, happened on Monday evening. Coventry City beat Maidstone 5-0 in the FA Cup fifth round. Maidstone United's FA Cup run 
came to an end. And it feels sad that it came to an end on a cold Monday night in an away fixture, which wasn't the glamorous tie that they really, really wanted. Don't get me wrong. It's a, it's still an enormous achievement to go and play at Coventry City, a very, very history club who have won the FA Cup themselves, you know, in, in living memory, depending on how old you are, but we are old enough. Uh, so, 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 no disgrace, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we wanted them to go out to Manchester City on a Saturday afternoon, where we could all kind of enjoy, or at least keep up with it on the radio, something like that. So it feels like it was a little bit of a, a bit of a shame. But that afternoon, where they beat Ipswich Town, they'll always have that. Uh, yeah, that they they will. And um, all all I can say is, where one dream dies, another is born. And I look forward to, um, I, I look forward to Hadji Wright scoring a diving header in the final at Wembley. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's all about, isn't it? Well, it, I mean, it is Coventry's first FA Cup quarter final of fifteen years, and Coventry, it's Coventry City have had some tough times of late. It's really fair tough. to say so. Really tough. So, yeah. So, so I'm I'm, I'm pleased for them. Mm. In in a way, but obviously it would have been great if Maidstone had managed to get through. Apparently they yeah. took four and a half thousand fans up there. Players did a lap of honour um, before kickoff, of course. Hopefully they did one after kickoff as well, uh, after uh, full time. Do you reckon that's why they lost five the nil? They started doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> That's what you, what you do. You can't, I appreciate that you're just happy to be here, but come on, this is taking the piss. Um, yeah, I will tell you what, Ipswich will look at that and go, "How did we get put out by that lot?" anyway yeah Maidstone they've been a credit to the competition we bloody love them yes um, the fact is we may never see them again realistically like it's, it is it is within the realms of possibility that people listening to this podcast never ever watch Maidstone, Maidstone United ever again um, in, in a game oh. of football who knows but it would be wonderful if they came roaring back though uh, next year although it does seem very unlikely yeah, I, I mean, look, it's, it's it's just an amazing achievement as it is. I mean, to to come from that level and and reach the fifth round of of, of the FA Cup is is extraordinary. So I, I know what you're saying about it would have been good for them to to, to get a real biggie, but look, they're punching well above their weight, and um, look, they've got some stories to tell. They, 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 they do indeed. Well, everybody, uh, we've come to the end of this Ramble Reacts. Do, do join us on Wednesday where myself, Andy, Jim and Pete will be discussing all the action from the FA Cup fifth round. In the meantime, do find us on uh, Twitter, currently known as X, TikTok, Instagram and YouTube at Football Ramble and do follow us on Spotify. I've just been uh, told that Jared Bowen said his Spider-Man DJ celebration was inspired by DJ Spider Raji. <laughs> Righto, everybody. Thanks, Andy. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. See you Wednesday. Cheers for watching another fantastic clip from the Football Ramble podcast. Make sure you click like on this video and subscribe to the channel, which means you will not miss a single upload.